We're not really that good at... (laughs) Waiting. (laughs) Sure, a little. We can handle the few minutes it takes to get our table ready, those moments before a concert begins. But any more than that, and we start to get a little uneasy. And in this instant world, it's just getting worse and worse. It's we're becoming less and less patient. It's why our radio stations now begin their Christmas programming just after Labor Day. We don't like to wait, and in some ways we get it, right? We know that to wait takes a level of patience that most of us just don't have, at least not enough. Waiting too long leaves us either anxious or bored, and though we've been told that boredom is an insult to oneself, we nevertheless feel it. Some of us might be experiencing it now. And we find our way to cope with it, to fill that time when we start to feel ourselves bored. We all have our mechanisms to do it. And while just a generation ago, even 10 years ago, our main go-to for time filling was, of course, to people watch or to make that grocery list in our head or to surreptitiously check our watch just to see when the sermon will finally be done. With the advent of the smartphone came the promise that we would never be bored again. Now, anytime we get even the inkling of starting to be bored, whether it's waiting for that light to change, our doctor to return, or that sermon to complete, we just pull out our phones and find our way somewhere else. Next time we're in a crowd of people, just stop for a moment to look at who is on their phone. Just count them for a moment. It might be easier to count who's not on their phone. Sure, it's not all of us, but it's not none of us either. We have found our way to use that device to take us somewhere else, to pull us somewhere else at the first inkling of being bored, of having to wait for something, we pull it out. And the challenge is that sometimes it takes us out of the moment itself. That we're so busy thinking about what's happening to the people on the other side of the screen that we miss what's happening right in front of us. Couples sit on the couch after a long day and browse their phones. Friends sit at the table next to one another and text someone else. Strangers miss would-be friends for one-time acquaintances. And for all of the effort, it's only solved part of the problem. We may very well be less bored, maybe, But by almost every measure, personal and societal, we are more anxious. It turns out that trying to maintain every conversation, keeping our streaks alive, constantly comparing our real lives to others' virtual ones doesn't make us any happier. Instead, it has unleashed an epidemic of loneliness too often born on the backs of our young people. We've done all this work to help young people pick up technology and virtually no work on how to help them put it down. But loneliness and anxiety and depression are real and overwhelming and almost impossible to battle alone. And so the real tragedy, of course, is that at the very time we need other people closer to us is the moment when we've pushed each other away. 
There are so many people in this world who have hundreds of virtual friends and virtually no real ones. We live in the almost absurd reality in which we can know what's going on with our college roommate's next door neighbor and miss the pain of the person sitting right next to us. Do you see we have sacrificed communion on the altar of connection and have missed the point? And we can bemoan it in our young people. We can look at them and say, oh, how can they never put down their phones? But the truth is, they learned it from watching us. We have raised a generation of young people who have never been given the freedom to be bored, so they never have known who they are and so have just trusted the insights of the people around them, often with nothing more than a fleeting glance or a simple tap, tap, tap of the like button. But we are more than our Facebook friends. We are more than our Snapchat streaks. We are more than our Instagram likes. We are more than our online profiles can reveal. We're more than our relationship status. We are children of a living God, young and old, black and white, gay and straight, male and female, rich and poor, broken and whole, Luddite and technology lover alike. We're the body of Christ called not just to connection, but to communion with one another, genuine, real relationship. We're called to take a step towards one another and make something new to experience God in that moment. Do you see? We're people of hope who don't just accept the world as it is, but work to make it what it could be. But it takes pausing and listening for that still, small voice crying out in the wilderness, there is another way. What is, is not what has to be. There's still hope. That's what this season is about. Advent is a season of preparation. It's why we pause in the middle of everything to listen to different kinds of music, to decorate our place in different ways, to notice that there is something different, that what is is not what has to be. It's a way that we pause to remind ourselves that hope is born out of our waiting. It is born out of our boredom. It is finding, it finds life in the midst of those liminal spaces, those times in between one thing and the next. We all need it at least once a year. If not once a year, then maybe once a month. If not once a month, then maybe once a week we could try it. Maybe, maybe we could even do it once a day to just pause and listen for the way God might be speaking to us. To hear the hope of our faith the best is yet to come, that good things come to those who wait. To be clear, this is not a season when we prepare for the birth of the Christ child. That already happened. This is a time in which we prepare for the world he promised would come, that kingdom of God, that world in which we all finally and fully live into the life that Christ commanded. Only it turns out that how we wait matters. As we learn in reading the passage for today, you see Luke was writing to an anxious people. He was writing to a people who were struggling to know what it meant to be God's people in the midst of everything that was falling down around them. He was writing 40 or 50 years after Jesus walked on the earth, and it was enough time to really mess some things up. 
The temple of Jerusalem, the second temple, had just been destroyed. The city had been sacked, and everything they had once known to be the reality around them had crumbled to the ground, and they lived each and every moment waiting for that next calamity to strike. We know the feeling, don't we? Constantly waiting for that next notification for something that could have been stopped. And Luke saw that in the midst of all of that brokenness, they needed Christ. He looked around the world, and like Matthew and Mark before him, he looked around and knew that if everything was falling apart this badly, if things were this poor in the world, then surely Christ was coming back at any moment. He had promised, hadn't he, that he wouldn't leave us alone, that he would be with us until the end of the age, and yet there they were utterly alone. And so he made a promise to his people. We hear it in the passage for today. He says, just like Matthew and Mark, this generation will not pass until all these things have happened. And the people who were stuck in the middle of all the pain and tribulation ate it up. The people who had just watched their leaders fall, their city crumble, their community destroyed, longed for a savior to save them. We know what that's like. We know what it's like to be in one of those moments of our life when everything seems like it's crashing down around us, like all of those things that we once held on to so tightly that rooted us to the ground seems like they're crumbling away and we're not exactly sure what to do when it happens. And we so often want to just throw up our hands and to say, someone else come in and fix this. I can't do it anymore. But that's not the way it works. Matthew and Mark and Luke all thought that Jesus was coming back any moment to set things right, only they turned out to be wrong. And here we are 2,000 years later, still Waiting. John, in his fourth gospel, writing a generation later, would have to make sense of where the others went wrong. He'd have to make sense of the new reality which was honest and faithful, a new reality which understood that Jesus wasn't coming back, that Christ wasn't coming back, at least not in the way we thought. You see, friends, we are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ for this world, which means he will only be fully alive among us when we are fully alive among us. Do you see? Christ has no hands and feet but ours. He has no voice but ours. He has no form to save this world but ours. That's what Jesus was trying to tell us, to show us the way of life that we are called to live that will bring a new world among us the world that he called the kingdom of God in which we all finally and fully live as Christ commanded, in which we all finally and fully take on the responsibility ourselves. He called us to look not to the clouds, but to the crowds, to each other. He promised that he would show up when we stepped up. Do you see, he did not leave us alone. He left us each other. And the promise that the closer we step towards one another, the more real Christ becomes. He left us with the charge to become the body of Christ for this world. But it takes pausing. It takes stopping long enough to see the world around us, to listen to one another, it means waiting. But we have something to do while we wait. 
So before we look to our phones, before we start getting our grocery lists ready, before we check the watch to see if this is almost over, it is. Maybe we ought to remind one another that though the hope of the gospel is that good things come to those who wait, the promise, the promise of the gospel is that whatever comes, we won't have to face it alone. And so stand up, raise your heads, for your redemption is drawing near. Amen.